Hello everyone and welcome to the 45th annual Art Deco Weekend. My name is Daniel Seraldo. I'm the Executive Director of the Miami Design Preservation League. We're very, very excited for our pre-recorded talk with Peter Sheridan entitled Deco Radio, the most beautiful radios ever made. And those of you who are attending the event know that radio is a theme of this year's event. We have a whole list of programs related to and inspired by the radio. And we thought it'd be great to have an introduction to Art Deco Radio from one of the world's premier experts and collectors on the topic. Dr. Peter Sheridan is a clinical senior researcher at Sydney University and a member of the Australian Institute of Professional Photography, as well as a committee member of the Art Deco and Modernism Society of Australia. He has been in general dental practice in Macquarie Street, Sydney since 1971 and is an accredited professional photographer specializing in fine art and also an internationally respected collector, historian, and lecturer in the field of art deco design. His collections are considered world-class and have been displayed by the National Gallery of Victoria and featured by the National Trust and the Historic Houses Trust. And he's the author of four major award-winning photographic reference books on design and architecture, including Radio Days, Deco Radio, Sydney Art Deco, and Sydney Art Deco and Modernist Walks. In 2001, Peter was honored by the Australian government and awarded a member of the Order of Australia for his work with people with multiple sclerosis. And he's an avid tennis player competing in Australia and overseas master tournaments. So for those of you interested in uh, other events here, definitely check out our website at artdecoweekend.com. Well, welcome, Peter. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for uh, uh, the invitation to speak to you from Sydney, Australia, on the other side of the world, and to be part of your Art Deco Weekend in Miami, and of course, the celebration of radio. Um, my, as you've heard, my name's Peter Sheridan. My profession is actually dentistry. Uh, my passion is photography. Uh, but my obsession is collecting, and that mainly focuses on Art Deco and particularly radios. Today, radio is becoming just another segment in the digital media landscape and part of many ways in which information and entertainment is received and accessed. But in its time, it was a major player in people's daily lives. And in fact, the first piece of technology that brought communication into the home and with content for everyone. This is a story about the advent of radio and how its trajectory was changed by Art Deco and by famous industrial designers. I think it's fascinating. I hope you might enjoy a look at a glorious moment in the story of radio that actually hasn't been well documented and today is barely remembered. It is also a story with a major US influence that reflects the global innovation and talent that America has fostered and which inspired the rest of the world. Sadly, I can't be in Miami this year, what with COVID and all, but I've spent some wonderful times visiting there. And, and although I'm not the most creative photographer, being more of an academic photographer than an artistic one, but this is my tribute to the signs of Miami around the South Beach area and a little montage of the wonderful 1950s cars that parade along the beachfront during the Art Deco weekend. As some of you might know, I'm, I'm a collector. Most of it is Art Deco inspired, and that includes art, glass, sculpture, furniture, clocks, jewelry, ceramics, ironware, and from all around the world. But it is the 300 plus radios that might give you the notion that I'm out of control. Way, way past being an expert connoisseur and heading for the demeaning status of a compulsive order but I'm actually saved by my wife, Jan, who's a wonderful woman who not only partners and encourages me, but is the talented curator of our possessions. She said at the outset some 20 years ago, buy only the best, they should be perfect and beautiful. And I happily complied. Although to be frank, I was all in after the first word. She ensures the radios are tastefully displayed and are not on every surface as would probably happen if I was in charge. My first two radios were American and Australian. They were bought in the 1990s in England on a whim. I knew absolutely nothing about radios. 
And I was really surprised they were plastic because they looked much more grand. What I realized fairly quickly was that it is a given that radio collectors focus on local works from their own country. And that's easy because they're accessible and it's patriotic. So Australians collect Australian radios, Americans collect American radios. But as a consequence, the perspective narrows. The story becomes somewhat self-indulgent and even distorted. And yes, there's also an understandable focus on repairs, restoration, stations, programs, and radio celebrities. But I was part of a little group that liked the plastic cabinets. And so for a few years, I followed the normal pathway and I concentrated on Australian radios, particularly the Bakelite ones. And this built the collection that underpinned my first book, Radio Days, in 2008, which nicely after 14 years is still selling well and has become a Bible for Australian collectors. But eBay was dangerously addictive and I kept buying the occasional, occasional, my wife would say every day, but occasional European, English and American radios and researching their origins. And it occurred to me that radios did not develop in parallel evolution. They didn't emerge unique and complete in each country and each new model being the result of local influences, but that like architecture, art, fashion and design, there would be moments of inspiration and innovation somewhere in the world, followed by recognition, diffusion and adaptation in other countries. Books on radios tend to be also country centric, but my research and my radios were telling me there was a bigger global story. And of course, I accept that the story of radio is fundamentally about a new communication medium involving the transmission of radio waves and the, top, and the technology involved. And then it's about the diverse content that comes out of the speaker. But I don't think this is the whole picture of radio and its evolution. And I think if you focus on the technology, it's a bit like saying that a car is only a measure of its engine and its wheels. So to the story of cabinet, radio cabinet design, the shape, the materials and the colors, they have multiple inputs from many people and manufacturers in a number of countries, which not only have implications for the story of radio, but actually add something really significant to the history of industrial design and the world of Art Deco. I must say that I know absolutely nothing about wiring diagrams and tubes or valves as we call them. In fact, the back of a radio is a complete mystery to me and I leave that to the group of guys for whom this is radio heaven. As we will see, the advent of new plastics changed the way in which technology was housed. It is worth mentioning that in the USA, 110 volts doesn't require a transformer, as with 240 volts used in uh, Australia, India, UK and Europe. Consequently, American radios can be made much smaller and are much lighter. Actually, making the radio work is the cheapest part of restoring a radio. A broken plastic cabinet is difficult to repair well and can bring the value down significantly. The best way to assess repairs uh, for those who are buying these sort of radios is to look inside the cabinet held up to the light. So what we want or what I want to explore today is a striking relationship between important industrial designers in the early days of their profession, the Art Deco movement, which was spreading globally in the 1930s and a subset of small radios of the 1930s and 40s which introduced mass-produced streamlined design and affordable radios into the home. It might be overstating it but this appears to be one of the first times that art met industry and that changed the way objects were perceived, produced and marketed and the end result was a fashionable yet relatively inexpensive product that could be consumed on a mass scale and was not restricted to the wealthy upper class. So that's the thesis of my book, Deco Radio, which I brought out in uh, 2014 and forms the basis for this presentation. It was released in the USA uh, and, and, and is available uh, through Shipper Books or through me. 
I think one of the first things we have to be aware of is that the time frame is really important here. There were three huge worldwide upheavals that bookend and punctuate the major time frame of our story. There's the legacy of World War I, the disaster of the Great Depression, and then the social and political upheaval in the build up to World War II. It's hard today to remember that radio was actually the beginning of a new form of mass communication. Perhaps the third wave after speech and print. Life was going to be lived out on a larger stage. The world was invading homes and the insularity of the home would never be the same again. Radio has the fastest uptake of any 20th century technology, including telephone, TV, and the internet. Exactly like the Art Deco movement, the development and uptake of radio began in the late 20s and reached a peak by the early 50s. The focal points in the early 30s were England, Germany, America, and Australia. By the 1940s, radio was a worldwide phenomenon and like Deco, it developed its own local style in each different country. Starting in the mid-20s, by 1940 in the USA, 90% of homes had at least one radio, whereas the car and the telephone were not at this level until the 1950s. 12 million households in the USA had a radio in 1930, rising to over 30 million by 1940. 75% of people got their news from the radio, and that was particularly so in rural areas and for those with literacy problems. Radio continued to flourish after World War II, but transistors came in, styling faded, as did Art Deco. So what is special about these radios? Let me start by making assertions and then we will explore them. We've said that 1930 was a time of global issues when many things were happening. The depths of the depression, a time of political change, particularly in Europe. On the positive side, radio is a significant new communication technology moving from a novelty to a necessity. Mains electricity is spreading into the home worldwide and this reinforces the uptake of radio. We're seeing a new design style, the machine age and speed are influencing the early expressions of streamlining and modern styles. And new materials such as plastics go hand in hand with mass production and the assembly line contributes to make the affordable radio a global phenomenon. Consumerism took off in the 1930s this was the idea that you aspired to buy things you could not afford and were encouraged to find ways to justify the purpose, the purchase. Advertising became a major feature in newspapers, magazines, and now in radio, giving birth to the commercial. The expansion of radio stations made them private commercial enterprises as against state-run media. Entertainment was underpinned by advertising and targeted marketing broaden the customers for radio. So we can see the advent of the tabletop or mantle radio as a distinct entity that was a huge influence on the way radio was perceived, marketed and used. This influence brought the full variety of information and entertainment in an affordable package to all members of the family. With women as consumers, radio had an aesthetic appeal and is one of the first pieces of deco in the home, not just as a piece of furniture for the lounge, but as an appliance with different purposes, different shapes, colours for every room in the house. And the deco styled radio was a symbol of the machine age, modernity, and perhaps the promise of a brighter future. Small radios were targeted for other rooms in the house not just the lounge, and they gave all members of the family a chance to independently choose their programs. By 1940, the Mantle Radio was outselling the console radio two to one, and it changed the listener from the family to the individual. It's important to make the point that while advertising for radios often used women, in the case of small 
cheap tabletop radio, it was also targeting women as consumers, not only for themselves, but through them, other members of the household became potential purchasers, such as children and the elderly. If the only radio in the house was the expensive wooden console in the lounge room, radio may have remained a male dominated family experience. And note that I, only I, the master of the house, have the wisdom to choose the program for the family and the skill to find the station and adjust the volume. As it turned out, the Art Deco tabletop radio became a stylish piece of decor in many rooms in the home. So let's see how all this happened. In 1924, the crystal set was a novelty. It needed earphones and had a limited range of stations and very poor reception. In 1926, the addition of tubes and a battery to power the receiver improved the reception, but still you needed earphones. In 1927, the addition of a loudspeaker allowed listening for more people. And by 1928, the availability of mains uh, electricity eliminated the need for a battery and access to home electricity actually expanded during the 20s, but more quickly during the 30s, and the stage was set for the next level of this evolution. Now, these are examples of commercial English crystal sets, rather than the homemade ones that you often see pictures of. This is one of the first single tube radios from Germany in 1926, and note the Bakelite base. Bakelite was actually used long before radios for electrical purposes, uh, switches, uh, wall outlets, uh, because of its non-flammability. And uh, a lot of small items were made in Bakelite before they managed to make larger items such as radios. In 1928, radio is becoming more and more popular, but it is stuck in the world of furniture and wood. Note the $325 price of the one on the top left without tubes or speaker and the $194 cost of the box and speaker on the bottom right. Now, many things that we see follow a linear trajectory. There's a clear evolutionary line from the horse and cart to the car, even though there were extraordinary changes in the source of power and materials used. Even today, we talk about a car's horsepower. The gramophone was a new technology in a recognizable piece of furniture, which evolved into the wooden console, which housed the radio, but clearly retained the essence of a standing piece of lounge furniture right through to the record radio record player of the 1950s. The radio box with the separate speaker predated the integrated wooden console. And in 1927, we see the first hint of real change. This extraordinary speaker in three sizes by Philips in 1927, designed by Louis Kauf in Holland, is not only the first piece of radio, proper radio out of Bakelite, but the first true expression of deco styling in the radio world. It was extraordinarily popular and sold in the millions all over Europe and the UK till 1932. It still sat on a wooden or metal box, which was almost invariably Victorian or Edward, Edwardian in style. And you can see that in the advert on the top right here, the wooden box below the speaker. The only comparable piece of Art Deco styling that I could find in the radio world at that time, 1927, was this tiny five inch tall mini Lux bedroom speaker, which was designed for the upmarket French ladies bedroom. These were made from celluloid, which is now organic plastic, which is both flammable and fragile. So as you can imagine, very few of these remain in existence but with the seven styles mim mimicking mother of pearl and one in tortoise shell, they display a full range of Art Deco finishes on the surface of the speaker with gaps in between uh, allowing sound to pass through. Our real story begins in Germany in 1929. 
without any fanfare, the Nora Radio Company in Germany made a complete mantle or tabletop radio. That is speaker, receiver, all in one and connected to the electrical outlet. In less than a year, the idea had spread to the UK, the USA and Australia. In all likelihood, the tabletop radio for the next 10 years or more would have looked like these, either Victorian and Gothic or a touch of deco all in wood. Now, I have to be fair that the Jackson Bell Company in Los Angeles produced a Sunburst model in 1929 or 1930, so it could be close for the first tabletop radio. This radio appeared in this iconic photo during the construction of the RCA building at the Rockefeller Centre in 1932. But back to Germany and the Nora Company, and I do think for the reasons that will follow, that this is probably where it all started. The next year in 1930, one year later, Nora went a step further. They created the first moulded Bakelite radio cabinet called the Sonnenblum or Sunflower. Here is not only a new form, but in a new material and a new style. And this for me is the first completely modern radio. As an aside, the Nora company was owned by a Jewish family called Aaron's and the name Nora being their name spelt backwards. In 1933, they were the fourth largest radio producer in Germany. Within a year, the company was Aryanized, producing Nazi radios and the Aaron's lost their business. But here we are, it's 1930, and we now have two new ideas, the tabletop radio and the Bakelite case. The idea spread like wildfire around the world, and now there was a potential for millions of bland brown Bakelite radios competing with the, brand, the bland brown wood tabletops. But something else happens to offset this. It's now the depths of the depression in the early 1930s. Nobody can afford anything, but everybody wants a radio, particularly if it is small, portable and affordable. So a few smaller radio companies in the US and one larger one in the UK explore the new potential market, which incorporates new design styles, the potential for mass production with the new plastics and maybe colors and getting more radios out there with a new batch of consumers and even more radios in each house or workplace. So they approach some designers. Many of the designers were established furniture designers associated with manufacturers already making wooden radios. And for them, the radio was invested in furniture and their palette was limited to wood. Many of these early successful companies like Atwater Kent did not stray from their wood radios and by 1940 were left behind. But the ones that interest us are the industrial designers. In the early 1930s, it was a new field. All of them had come from other professions such as graphic design, theater sets, fashion illustration and architecture. They had little or no work during the depression, but the radios were selling regardless of the tough times. And although these commissions to design radios were not as prestigious as designing trains and boats and buildings and other important pieces that these designers are famous for, but in the early and mid thirties, these designers had to take work when it was offered. They used a wide range of materials, but mainly the plastics and their coherent link, sorry, their coherent link was the shedding of fussiness in favor of streamlined design. Thus with the plastics, the radio case could be produced as a simple box with some flourishes or something much more adventurous. Mass producing the new molded non-flammable plastics as the shell that surrounded the chassis tubes and speaker allowed for both size reduction and stylistic freedom. And even though we are talking about a small subset of radios, this is not a minor phenomenon. I've found hundreds of radios, beautiful deco radios in 15 countries. 
I've identified an amazing 37 designers. Most of these are in the USA and UK with a, a representative each from Germany, Italy and Holland. But it's important to recognize that their influence was global, reinforcing the spread of the deco style in radio all around the world. If you look at this short list, it's surprising how many of the world's most illustrious industrial designers and the founders of streamlining contributed to radio design. And not only that, they were both innovators and an impetus for the spread of the streamline style in radio right around the world. Not only is their contribution significant, but the timing is really important. This slide might seem a bit dense, but if you look at the red, which is the radios, the clear commonality is that the radios were designed early in their careers, most during or just after the Depression and at the dawn of the industrial design profession. In fact, they all worked for small companies very briefly. And the only long-standing arrangements with radio companies were John Vassis, who spent 20 years with RCA, and Wells Coates spent 10 years with Echo. In almost every case, the designs for which these designers are well known came after they designed their radio. And most of the biographies of these designers do not include their radios. In the USA, Harold Van Doren and Raymond Lowy started the ball rolling in 1933. Van Doren was the president of the Society of Industrial Design. Lowy was known as the father of streamlining, the man who shaped America, and the father of industrial design. Bill Geddes was known as the man who designed America, John Vassos, the quintessential modernist, and Dorwin Teague as the Dean of Industrial Design. All of these men are more famous for other creations, everything from a matchstick to a city. And there are more, mainly in the 30s, but some in the 1940s. Even Charles and Ray Eames ventured into radio design early, some 10 years before their famous lounge chair, which you might be able to see in the background behind me. In the UK, the Echo Company led the world in the early 30s using well-known architects such as Coates, Chermayev, White, Collins and Black to produce modern style radios in these new plastics. Coates designed the first round radio in the world, which is now regarded as one of the modern movement's groundbreaking designs of the early 20th century. He actually refined the use of the circle within the radio itself, a feature which spread right throughout the world. But try as they might, Echo, for all their beautiful designs, could not get the British public to buy a coloured radio until the late 40s. If you look at the green Echo at the top left, this is the first of the series from 1934. And this green one is one of only three or four that are known to exist, and all were display examples. Now, this is a big radio compared to US Catalans some 15 inches in diameter. And you have to laugh at the advert on the bottom right with the lady casually holding the radio on the edge of the shelf as if it was really lightweight. This radio is some 18 pounds in weight, hardly portable, uh, rather more luggable. In Italy, we have the Castiglione brothers, Louis Kauf in Holland or Netherlands for the Philips company and Kirsting in Germany, notable for utilizing radio design for political and propaganda purposes. A good example of the timing of these designs can be seen for Raymond Lowy. His cold spot refrigerator, Pennsylvania Railroad, Shell logo, came well after the Westinghouse Column Air of 1931, which was a console clock radio, and the Colonial Radios of 1933. Note the price of the Westinghouse at $193 was six times the cost of the colonial radio on the right here, which was $30. The Lowy's New World series, this is an extraordinary variant because it normally came in black, sorry, in black, brown and ivory bakelite. But one variant comes with proper uh, paper gauze a globe over the brown Bakelite globe. For many years, these were seen as novelty radios and people just ignored them. 
but actually it's a wonderful piece of engineering and design reflecting the modernity and universal nature of radio and is actually a truly a piece of uh, early piece of industrial design by one of the great designers. The horizon knob on the left does the volume while the one on the right changes the station which you can see in the small dial screen in the middle. Again with Darwin T. His radio designs are early in his career, before or at the same time as the gas stations, Texaco, but before the Grand Pian Steinway Grand Piano, the desk lamp of 39 and the Polaroid land camera of 1948. Harold Van Doren, uh, his radios were at the same time as the Skippy uh, Racer Scooter of 1933, but the uh, well-known Toledo scale and Maytag washer came much later. Osama Noguchi's radio nurse speaker was a decade before his well-known table and bamboo chair. The Castiglione brothers in Italy were just out of university when they designed the Fanola radio. Their Arco lamp came 20 years later. Now, the impact of these designers and their radios on both small and large radio companies in the USA was substantial. And even though many other companies did not have named designers. Their results for their radios were different, yet all aspiring to match that benchmark set by the industrial designers. And you can see here the Symphonies, the Faders, Garrods, Cadets, Motorola's, Addison's, Radio Glow, Emerson's and Sentinel's, uh, all beautiful radios and similar to the wonderful designs started by the industrial designers. And that didn't just happen in the US and the UK, it happened all around the world. Because we know that Art Deco is the first global design movement. And you can see that in many countries uh, and particularly in radio design where those radios very quickly uh, reflect the new standards set by those industrial designers. My collection spans 15 countries. And in all cases, the timing and the similarities made those connections clearly causal. You can see the Artes radio from Spain, the wonderful EGM radio from Mexico, Bang & Olufsen's beautiful Scandinavian style uh, from Denmark, uh, Australia's ADA, AWA radio let, the Rubus from Belgium and the Sonora Sonorette from France. Now, in Australia, the influence was not only immediate, but blatantly an unsubtle plagiarism. The Astor Company in radio in the same year, 1933, stole Lowy's Colonial 300 chrome design for their radio, Mickey radio on the left here, uh, as well as stealing Disney's Mickey and Minnie names for the speaker, for the radio and the external speaker. Uh, I actually think that the motif on the front of the mini speaker is a beautiful progression on Lowy's theme and perhaps even more beautiful as an Art Deco motif than Lowy's original intersecting circles. Obviously emboldened by stealing Lowy's designs and using the names Mickey and Minnie, Astor brought out the Bakelite Mickey Mouse in 1949 for about $26, even stealing Disney's imagery. This brought on a major court case with Asta, uh, winning the right to use the Mickey name, but not the image. Just out of fun, the, uh, if you look at the dial here, um, Australia's radio stations uh, had a two letter symbol. And if you look at the top right uh, corner, somebody thought it was funny to put two country stations, Dubbo, D-U, and Cessnock, C-K, close together, spelling the word duck. Now, most of what happened with the new small radio had to do with the use of resins or plastics. In 1907, Leo Bakerland invented Bakelite. And so with that first synthetic plastic began a resin revolution that pervades our world today. Original Bakelite is a heat molded phenol formaldehyde limited to dark colors. From 1930, it became the major material for radio cabinets. In 1925, urea formaldehyde was invented in the UK. It's also molded, but can be produced in many colors. And after 1933, became popular in the USA and Australia for radios and with many brand names such as Plascon, Tenite and so forth. The term Bakelite is generally used to cover all molded resins. 
1927. Catalan was invented in the USA and is a cast phenol formaldehyde without fillers and is more translucent. From 1936, beautiful coloured Catalan radios were made only in the USA in every colour imaginable, but were more expensive because they needed hand finishing and were subject to fracture. All these new plastics were significant for radio because they allowed designers to create cheap mass produced cabinets, which reflected the new machine age styling. Many of the other materials used for radio cabinets followed the forms and shapes achieved with the new plastics. While you see many pictures of colored radios, it is really striking that Australia and the US are the only two countries in the world that embrace color radios in the 30s and 40s. UK and Europe had only wood and brown bakelite till the 50s when colored radios became more popular. It's interesting that if you look at the Australian grouping down the bottom, and if you ignore the mottle blue green AWA, which was a one off cabinet made for an exhibition, the five other colours were designed to mimic in plastic more expensive materials ebony, ivory, jade, marble, and walnut. While the Air Kings from the US have unashamedly vibrant shades, 11 of them. I think AWA in Australia was still unsure about the public perception of plastic and hedged their bets. The Detroler Super Pee Wee Midget came out in eight different plastic colour variations, all at $20 each. And that's a lot cheaper than the $130 of a wooden console. And you can see that here, um, if you look at the affordability and the attraction of small mass produced uh, plastic radios, it's clear when you look at the costs of a wooden console, 193 uh, and 85, 139 for the Zenith on the bottom right. And a really good example gives us a clear sense of how the market could be approached with a small radio, having the same uh, general design offered in a number of variations. The RCA Little Nipper, designed by John Vassos, was offered in wood and three types of plastic, all at a different price point. Very much cheaper than the wooden console, which may have had higher fidelity, but for most people, these worked well enough and they were really affordable. Brown Bakelite was the cheapest at $9.95, coloured urea formaldehyde, uh, $12.95, uh, wood at $14.95 and the most expensive were the Catalans. Fewer Catalans were made and sold and their rarity today and their beauty adds to their value. So although there are millions of cheap and featureless dark brown radios in Bakelite, there are also many that show the influence of the designers and stand above the pack. And you can see them here from the USA, UK, Australia, Czechoslovakia uh, and Germany, beautiful uh, Art Deco style Bakelite radios, even though they're brown and black. With the woods and the dark Bakelite, you basically had a model with one version. But the moment we got into urea formaldehyde and colors, it meant multiple versions for each model and color choices for the consumer. Here you can see Australian ones at the top, USA in the middle, uh, Italy, UK and France. But remember that all of these did not appear until the very late 40s or early 50s, where all of these are generally 30s and 40s. Now, in Australia, the Aster Mickey model, which we spoke about before, was actually the most successful radio in Australia with a 10 year span through the 1940s. And as far as I can see, a world record, 22 different colours using the same cabinet mould. Colours can be really bold. These two rare little DeWolds in mulberry and blue are really intense offset by the different colour handle knobs and feet. But nothing beats American Catlins. They're just eye candy. All the colours of the rainbow, more translucent than Bakelite and urea formaldehyde because of the cast process and with wonderful swirls which are different for each radio. Note the mix and match of colours, cabinet one colour, bezel handles and knobs another. That creates an enormous range of colour offerings for the same model. It's common today, but this is where it really became an integral part of product design. How simple, how clever. 
it would be unfair to presume that all wood radios missed the, de the deco makeover. These American and Australian radios show some lovely deco touches, but they're quite small. Long before the first motorcycle that they made in 1949, Ducati made radios. And this is a 1940 Ducati radio shaped like a bread basket. The Ducati signature on the top of the radio is a fabulous touch. In the later 1940s, large department stores like Sears sold small, cheap chrome radios like the, those in the two top rows. And they're both beautiful and collectible today. And nothing beats chrome and the parallel lines to symbolize the machine age and mass production. The addition of chrome highlights made a huge difference to the appeal of wood radios. Mirrored glass, usually in blue or peach, and some with chrome accents, were avant-garde at the time. And the few radios were produced with glass and metal, such as the Radio Glow here. The Vassos designed radiogram on the bottom right was made from aluminum. Probably the most spectacular Art Deco radios ever made are the mirrored glass Spartan Nocturne and its baby brother, the Bluebird, by Darwin Teague. They still have that sense of coming from the future and are still exquisite today. The four foot diameter nocturne was probably designed for a major Hollywood house or a hotel foyer. And there are probably maybe 10 or 20 left today. Most are in museums and you might be able to see behind my head. Uh, I think I may have the only one outside the USA. And they're the most valuable of the Art Deco radios with exceptionally high prices. The little bluebird, as you can see down there, came with an optional display plateau mirror base. Very pretty. Um, I like these two adverts for the Spartan Nocturne and Bluebird. They're in my book but I've not been able to add, uh, identify the two actresses. I, I thought the one on the left might be June Allison. I'm hoping a movie buff listening to this lecture might be able to help me out. This little Remler Scotty in the top in black and white Bakelite was also offered with an alternative blue mirrored glass sleeve, creating two visual forms, uh, which you could use one or the other, depending on your taste and surrounding decor. New plastics such as lucite and acrylic were seen in the late 40s. They, leaded, they led to uh, plastic radios common in the 50s before transistors changed radio forever and tube radios disappeared. A very interesting story about this Pi portable here from England is that the sunrise motif had been used by Pi from the 1930s. And after World War II, they released this radio uh, in colour with the deco styling and the, and the, and the uh, sunrise motif de decofied. There was an immediate backlash from the UK public feeling that the motif was too much like the Japanese rising sun. The whole production run was recalled and destroyed. And the only ones that are remaining today are those that had already been sold. There was always paint work that you could do over Bakelite, metal and wood and, and a number of radios in, in, in a number of countries uh, uh, use this, this approach. Um, and I look at this flocked Air King of 1933 and, and how modern it is and that this, is, this was on the market 100 years ago, and yet today seems like such a modern finish. Um, we pride ourselves on being modern today, but something was happening in, in that era, uh, and these radios reflected that wonderful innovation of style. If we look at the stylistic range of radio in the early to mid 30s, you can see here in these three exquisite sam examples, some, the whole range. Um, on the left is the Rubus radio from Belgium, showing its European roots and sinuous Art Nouveau heritage. It's a cross between Gaudi and Alva Alto, sticking with wood, looking forward to deco while still afoot in the past. The echo from England is elemental and restrained, the best of mass production with Bakelite, with a, a hint of Bauhaus and arts and craft, but clearly moving to a new future. And if you note, the vertical lines in the radio are matched by the vertical lines in the stand. Spartan is the US at its best, exuberant, unrestrained, innovative. The new streamlined machine age style of the 1930s, utilizing chrome and mirrored glass, shedding history, saying goodbye to the past. 
After the war, Art Deco styling faded. Radio became just another commonplace appliance. The 1950s could be called the atomic age with really cheap plastics, every choice of color and a more replaceable feel to the radio. Some of these became the third and fourth radios in the house as there was much more disposable income in Western households. And the 1960s herald the, the transistor age with miniaturization, standardization, looking somewhat like our phones today, all much the same shape and design with minimal external differences. Of course, the story of radio is not just about the cabinet, but it served as the magic reservoir for radio programs, which once you got past the warming up, the static and the tuning were involving, entertaining, compelling, even inspiring. In the 1930s, shows like Amos and Andy were almost compulsory listening for the American public, attracting as many as 40 million listeners at an episode. But radio was not always benign. Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in Germany, and Lenin in the, in the Soviet Union used government ownership to make radio an efficient propaganda tool starting around 1932-33. By 1934, all radio manufacturers in Germany had to devote some 40% or more of production to these people's radios, such as the Volksempfänger, designed by Kirsting, which could only broadcast Nazi radio stations. In fact, it's interesting that when people left Germany after the war uh, and emigrated elsewhere, many of them took this radio, thinking it was their one prized possession. In the two Italian radios, you can see Mussolini's acts in the grill work. During World War II, the American poet Ezra Pound made numerous pro-fascist broadcasts on Italian shortwave radio targeted at listeners in the United States. The Nazis strived to ensure that all Germans were immersed in their propaganda. This advert says, all Germany hears the Fuhrer with a Volksempfänger. And as I said, radio manufacturers had to devote at least 40% of their effort to producing these. And to the point where one was considered a traitor if one listened to broadcasts from outside Germany. And that brings up another innovation that came with the new plastic radios. The incorporation of shapes, imagery and motifs into the cabinet design, which reflected everything from scenery to speed, something that didn't happen at all with or very little with traditional wood consoles or even wood tabletops. This Australian Weldonet radio of 1937 has three completely different representations. The external cabinet is in the architectural form of a skyscraper. The speaker grill is overlaid by a Bakelite pastoral Australian scene with the sunrise. And the dial when it's on shows the world and electricity. This may have been a multifaceted marketing strategy or just a radio designed by a committee. And incidentally, there are only three known examples of this radio, two black and one brown. There are a few instances of ancient indigenous cultural motifs being expressed in radio design because these things were very popular in the 1920s and 30s. On the, on the left of these two, the Air King um, with its uh, Egyptian style insert reflects the fascination of the public with newly found tombs in Egypt in the, in the 1920s, Tutankhamun's tomb. And the wooden Zenith stratosphere, which was a technically very advanced and beautifully made radio with all sorts of exotic woods and a price tag of over $750, had an optional black or white cat for the alcove in the radio. And that cat was styled basically on the ancient Egypt feline deity. And that is the most expensive wood console radio today. Extraordinary examples are these two EGM radios from Mexico in 1940. They have a clear Aztec style design in the grill. This uh, Addison, uh, from Canada is nicknamed the courthouse, but to me looks like a Mayan temple. Some radios derive clearly from other streamlined objects, skyscrapers, as you see on the left, and trains and rockets, as you can see from Clarence Carstead's uh, rocket, silver tone rocket here from 1938. Um, they could be designed based on the aerodynamic shape of a bullet, as you see in the Sciarts. Uh, on the top here and the fader bullet here. And even like a sled, 
in uh, Darwin Teague's uh, Spartan 558. Some radios are just, uh, show uh, their roots in, in cars. Uh, and here you see from three European countries, they show a local flavor in the way uh, the radio is represented uh, through uh, a vehicle's, uh, the front of a vehicle. Um, the Bang & Olufsen clearly shows a Scandinavian flourish, and it was one of their first Bakelite radios, and they actually still use the name Bealit for their current models of speakers today. Uh, this is an artist from Spain, and the guy who designed this was actually a car manufacturer. And these two from France uh, show uh, that, that wonderful uh, grill-like effect in the front. Um, to many purists, these are just decorative embellishments, but today we recognise the innovative use of new materials, new shapes, new colours, and a design heritage that pushed the radio beyond its core function to become a beautiful object in the home or workplace. This beautifully rendered Spartan chrome accents on the front of the Bluebird show the shape of a triplane. Uh, and almost as far away in sensibility is the depiction of the theatre and stage in these Australian and German radios at the bottom. The flying saucers were uh, big in the 50s, 40s uh, and 50s, and a few radios reflect uh, that imagery such as the, the Cadet Topper uh, from 1939. Waterfalls can be seen uh, in the Arvin and Addisons here. And unusual is the butterfly design in this Excelsior from France from 1948. The sun's rays are a popular deco motif. And you can see that here from Australia, a couple of radios here, England, uh, and the Jacksonville sunburst uh, from the USA. Flowers can be seen in the act. We saw that in the Nora Sonnenblum, in the Minilux speakers, here in the Philips radio, and gone berserk in this rather unusual uh, uh, Belgian example. Rural scenes, difficult to create in plastic. The Genelex overcomes it with it being printed into the speaker cloth. This wooden radio has it uh, with different colored woods. Uh, this British, um, Philips provides a symbolic sky and stars cleverly in Bakelite with a light speaker cloth behind. In Australia, uh, this was produced uh, and, and nicknamed obviously the scales, was supposed to be able to be mounted on a wall, but at about six pounds weight, it was a complete disaster. Not only was it difficult to attach the wall, but it was in a million pieces if it hit the ground. One novelty radio designed to look like a shelf of books was this uh, RCA Victor, actually made in Chile for the American market. A beautiful radio is this General Electric, comes in beautiful translucent marbleized reddish tortoise uh, color and closed looks just like a jewelry box. If you open it up, it reveals uh, the radio dials and the speaker grill in between. Rarely in, in the radio world was there any semblance of mimicking the human form, although clearly this was intended in Noguchi's design for a remote speaker relaying sounds from a child's room. And perhaps unintended is Jesse Collins' Echo Radio, which is most appealing because it has a sort of benign robotic face. Um, incidentally, at over 21 inches tall, it is probably the largest one-piece Bakelite moulding for radio ever made. The Stuart Warners on the top have a flapper cut out in metal, sorry, in metal, uh, very simple, very clever. Uh, you've seen the Mini Lux speakers uh, and they have two different flappers uh, on uh, two different examples with different paintwork uh, on the celluloid. Uh, this uh, rather elegant Siemens radio cabinet was nicknamed gentleman in a tuxedo, probably not intended in the design. But what appeals to me is this is probably the closest to Bauhaus in a radio design, simple lines and minimal decorative elements. Few radios are considered sexy, but the rather outrageous Count Alexis Sarknovsky produced this for Emerson in 1938. And the shape seems to have clearly human counterparts and was quickly named the May West. But the truth is actually stranger than fiction because apparently Sarknovsky knew May West and this is her in action in the film Going to Town um, from 35. And the radio truly duplicates her costume and special attributes. 
And according to her secretary, who I met, May enjoyed the attribution and had one of these radios in her private study. I'm not really into kids novelty radios, but these are beautifully made radios using famous American characters added into the recess on the front of the cabinet. Often missed is the escutcheon, which houses the dial and knobs, can be in metal or plastic, and these often contain wonderful delicate deco details. If you look at the uh, Egyptian scarab uh, holding the magic eye at the bottom, that links to the past, whereas the beautiful circles and lines of the Spartan in the center look to the future. Mix and match colors aren't seen before 1935. And surprisingly, the first I can identify where a cabinet in a base color has inserts such as a grill and feet in different colors is with the Australian AWA radio in 1935 with a black cabinet and the grill and feet offered in white or marble, white marbled or green. I think this innovativeness is marred by it looking like another case of stealing design by us Aussies, as the Oriental style grills look like they were copied from the International Cadet released in the USA in the same year. You can see similarities in the oval uh, shape, the little man figure, and the circles. And that can't be happenstance. However, the feet mimicking lion-like paws on the radio lets are pretty early and unique. But the true expression of mix and match came with the Catlin radios in the USA, starting with Fader in 1936. The cabinet was originally white, but oxidizes to a beautiful butterscotch over time. And the insert came in red, green, and blue. Fader radios evolved as did their color schemes seen in the Fader bullets of the early 40s. Motorola produced some stunners such as the circle grill in 1940. Reversing and mixing colors for different parts created an even more extensive range of colored versions of the same radio. You can see that for the Arvins, the Air Kings and the Garrods here. Regarded as one of the most elegant radios ever made, Teague's tiny cloisonne radio came in four colors with a combination of Catalan cabinet, urea formaldehyde knobs, and a metallic cloisonne front trimmed with a latticework of chrome elements using circles and parallel lines. And I used it for the cover of my book as it represented the very best of deco radio design. One of the smartest mix and match designs was Bell Getty's wartime Patriot, which channeled the American flag in three mix and match color versions. Of course, patriotism was rife in the Cold War of the 50s. And this is the Russian Red Star radio in bold red. Here, the Red Star lights up uh, when the radio is turned on. And although there are political overtones, it doesn't have quite the malevolent uh, overtones of the pre-war German people's radios. Because of the war and Russia's poor economic conditions after World War II, radios were not produced like this until well after 1948 um, and even into the 50s. And the cabinet shape in this case was licensed from the SNR company in France who made a similar radio. I should mention from an Art Deco point of view, parallel lines are a standard feature of the style and one of the hallmarks of streamlining. And I could find only 10 radios in my 300 plus radios with no evidence of parallel lines in the design. And you can see them all here. While I'm not a fan, a great fan of wooden consoles, which in the main are very similar, Occasionally, there's a gem such as the small radio alva from France with its elegant vertical lines and tapering shape. But to me, um, the zenith is beautiful. We saw that previously, but the best wooden console in the world, I think, is the 1934 Pacific Elite from New Zealand. Of course, it was handmade, not mass produced. There are probably only three or four left in existence. Um, again, it's behind me uh, in, in my study. Um, there is no known designer yet it is the true expression of Art Deco aesthetic. And in this case, the artisan has overcome the intrinsic limitations of the material to create an iconic piece of art. I don't know about you, but everybody seems to be buying a COVID puppy. We have one too. Uh, and this photo has a number of connections for today. Um, it's uh, this Harbanese uh, uh, puppy, which not very far from Miami, 
uh, and popular in Miami, is sitting on a, his master's voice radio, uh, which was prominent in the 1930s and 40s with our local styling to accommodate the 240 volt uh, uh, chassis. The little logo, of course, is a dog. Um, and that's seen on the radio, and it can still be seen on the Nipper building in New Jersey. So radio um, from that period uh, is still alive and well, even in architecture. So in summary, if you just look at radio as a communication device, you miss that subtle and fundamental change that occurred in 1930 with the advent of the tabletop radio and the incorporation of streamlined design. The conception is Europe, the birth is in America, but the development and maturation is worldwide. The impact of industrial designers so early in their careers is significant yet ignored. Their ability to use new materials create new designs for a radio cabinet, which was portable, affordable and marketable in difficult times was momentous. And so what occurred here was that these designers helped change radio from a novelty to a necessity. The integrated tabletop radio took radio out of the lounge into all rooms of the house and into the workplace. Using synthetic materials rather than traditional organic materials, the artisans with wood were replaced by mass production and an assembly line. And the radio became more affordable. With more than one set in the house, there were many more listeners for a wider variety of programs. And with news and entertainment, the home became part of the outside world. The variety and cabinet shapes and colors of the radio made it not just a piece of furniture, but a stylish domestic appliance, part of decor. The designs of the industrial designers were innovative and inspired, not just extensions of traditional Victorian and Gothic styles, and the introduction of color made radio animated and with many choices for the consumer able to be part of the room decor. Many people ask me what my favorite radio is and truthfully every day is different and they all speak to me in diverse ways. Of course, in my shallow moments, the most valuable, but more often I look around and each one I've chosen resonates with the special attributes in design, presentation, color and history, which I still find attractive and satisfying. The breadth and depth of dissemination of these radios speaks to the global nature of Art Deco and adds to the contention that these radios represent a cogent, comprehensive and international illustration of the style as well as the work and influence of the great world's industrial, world's great industrial designers. And that, I said, is the thesis of my book. And while this international collection that you see here may never be on public display, at least in the book through photography, the radios are immortalized together. And as radio morphs into being just another segment of the digital media world we have available to us, it's really important we recognize its unique history and preserve the evidence of its glorious beginnings, which is wonderful that you are doing this uh, at your Art Deco weekend. Unfortunately, as this is pre-recorded, there's no opportunity for discussion. So if you have any questions, comments, or additional information, please feel free to contact me at peter at petersheridan.com. So for the sake of heritage and legacy, I feel it important not only to articulate the evolution of radio, social, technical, and design manifestations, but to, get, to gather together the great actors in this story to let them share the stage together and take a well-earned bow. From an Art Deco point of view, it's easy to venerate expensive elitist pieces, much more challenging to recognize and preserve the common objects like radio, some of which have an extraordinary design heritage, resonate with the style, actually change the world. I hope you have enjoyed this brief foray into another aspect of the wonderful world of Art Deco, in this case, through the unusual filter of the story of radio design. And I thank you for allowing me to share my passion for radio with you. Thanks. Wow, thank you so much, Peter. It's uh, just an amazing collection you have and you really brought these radios to life. Uh, I'm looking and staring at my iPhone here thinking, uh, I wonder if design has really progressed uh, in certain ways 
seems like uh, I'd love to have these uh, great unique uh, radios instead. Um, and uh, thank you once again for this amazing presentation. Right, my pleasure. And for those of you who are uh, participating in the Art Deco Weekend, we'll see you around these next several days. Please make sure to check out our website at artdecoweekend.com. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon, Peter, in Miami Beach in the I future. Hope, I, I hope we can travel soon. And, uh, and it's, it's on my list of places to visit. Wonderful. All right. Thanks again. Take care. All the best. Bye. Thanks, Daniel.